Our text for this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning in the 13th verse, and there we find these words. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of God's holy word. Let us pray together. O God, you have called us to be your people, one people, based on the confession of one Lord, a shared faith, a common baptism, bound together by the presence of your Holy Spirit. And you have sent us into this world, O God, on behalf of your kingdom to be about your restoration your transformation of creation. Jesus taught us to be salt and light. Surely that's needed in our world today, O oh God. As we've watched the events of this week, the ongoing pandemic, political division that has led to violence, it's so clear and so obvious that the presence of your church as salt and light in this world is desperately needed. And you call us to pray, O oh God. You once told Solomon in the dedication of the temple that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and turn from our own way and seek your face, that you will heal our land. As your people today, O oh God, we would seek your face. And we repent of all the ways that we have failed to love as you've called us to love, to obey as you've led us for all that we have done and left undone. And we pray for your forgiveness as your people. And we come to you today, O oh God, praying on behalf of our nation, praying for healing, praying for restoration, praying for comfort for those who mourn, but most of all, praying today, O oh God, that your light and your love would shine brightly from your people. So teach us today and in the weeks to come what it means for us to be the church you need us to be on this corner. What it means for us to live out the new community of faithfulness you are calling us to be today in the life of Calvary Baptist Church. And especially today, oh God, what it means for us to be founded upon the sole confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray you would teach us now, O oh God, for this time is yours. May these words be yours as well. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The church is a miracle. The church is a miracle. Now, some places I've preached before, somebody might say amen after something like that. Do y'all do that here? The church is a miracle. 
Just think about it for a minute. Today, two and a half billion people identify as Christians in our world today. That's nearly a third of the global population. Around the world today, people from different cultures, different countries, different backgrounds, worshiping in different ways, in different places, in caves and basements and under trees and grand cathedrals have all gathered together to worship Jesus, the Son of God. And that's a miracle. The church is an amazing thing. Put together from all a diverse population of people, and now in place over 2,000 years, all of that grown out of the single confession of one person, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a miracle that we're here today gathered and worshiping God together. Because the church has suffered through the years from attacks from within and without, It took us a long time just to get ourselves together, some 300 years. It took us to figure out what we believed and how we would go about practicing our faith, to decide what books belonged in the Bible and all that. It took us about 300 years to do that, and that was not without a great deal of controversy and struggle. And conflict has kind of always marked our history. We've been through schisms and reformations. In recent years, we fought over the nature of the Bible and how we would worship, and millions of churches have gone through splits over the colors of carpet, and yet we are still here. We've been attacked from without. Generations of the church has been persecuted, and there are churches around the world today who face persecution. There are some who wanted to abuse us and others who just wanted to use us. The church has been both the sword and the victim in the hands of temporal powers. And yet we are still here. The church has been well led and misled. The church has included, excluded, and secluded. And yet we are still here. And just think about this church, Calvary Baptist Church, now over 170 years old, born in the days of Reconstruction, born, by the way, out of a church split from the first Baptist to the, or the Baptist Church of Lexington to what would become the second Baptist Church and Pisgah and on and on until eventually we would become Calvary. And think about all that this church has endured in that period of time. Two world wars, a cold war, two now global pandemics, the Great Depression, multiple recessions, a few building campaigns, which is enough for any church to endure, and a parade of pastors and ministers over the years. And yet we are still here. The church is a miracle. There's nothing else we can call this great enterprise of God's kingdom that is the church of Jesus Christ than a God-ordained and God-empowered, spirit-infused miracle. And we are here today because we share one thing, one confession, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and they found their way in a town called Caesarea Philippi, which in and of itself had all kinds of connections to empire, named after both Caesar and Philip, the son of Herod. It contained a huge temple to Caesar Augustus. And walking along in that place, Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, who do you think that I am? We know who these people are. Who who do you think that I am? And we know it by heart, don't we? 
We've heard it so often. I still hear it in the King James. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah. Some say one of the prophets. Jesus said, well enough. Who do you, my friends, my companions, my disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter couldn't help himself. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're right. Not because you know, but because it's been revealed to you. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because it has been revealed to you the truth of who I am has been given to you, and now you have confessed that truth. And based on your confession of that truth, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom so that what you lock up here will be locked up in heaven and what you loose here will be loosed in heaven. Upon your confession of faith. And you see, it is the power of that shared confession that enlivens the church today. It is our shared confession of Jesus as the Christ that binds us together. And sometimes I think that's the only thing that does. That one confession that is the bottom line, the the only criterion to be in the church of Jesus Christ, to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We debate a lot of other stuff. Oh sure, there have been creeds adopted through the years and Adopted and set aside, used and unused. We have discussed at times the Bible is the foundation of our faith. And I think most Christians would agree with that. But we vary on how we read and apply it. No, when it all comes down to it, the single thing that holds us together, the thing that binds us together as the church of Christ in this world today is that singular confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Life Together, Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. When we confess that Jesus is the Christ, we put Jesus at the center of our community and we relate to one another through the presence of Christ in our center. Now we need to also acknowledge what Jesus says to Peter here that We only know that because it's been revealed to us. Jesus is not the Christ because we say he is. We say he is because Jesus is the Christ. You follow the logic? It's because who Jesus is has been revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. And for many of us, through the generational confession of the church, that's where we first learned it. It is our confession of the truth that has been revealed to us that binds us together as God's people that Jesus is the Christ. And our shared confession does more than just bind us together as the people of God. It empowers our perseverance in the world. Jesus told Peter and the other disciples who were gathered there, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. You see, when we confess Jesus as the Christ and we put that confession at the center of who we are, we are then accessing the power and the presence of Christ that will sustain and protect us as we do the work that God has called us to do. When I first met you back in the summer, I told you then that I've heard a lot of people hand-wringing about the nature of the church. So-called prophets who predict the demise of the church of Jesus Christ. They say that we're out of step, out of touch, irrelevant, unnecessary. 
And that was all before the pandemic. And now the experts who look at us during the pandemic wonder what will happen if the church will be the same when we come out of this. And I want to tell you this morning, we will not be the same. Anytime we go through something, hopefully we don't come out the same. Hopefully God's been at work in us doing something new in a way that we come out better than we were when we went in. I think we will be changed. And maybe that's what God is doing right now, is changing us, stripping away some things that we didn't need and bringing us to a better realization, a better understanding of what's essential in our life together. And by the way, I don't buy the narrative that some folks would peddle that the church here in this place in this community in our nation is necessarily being persecuted there are places today in the world where the church is being persecuted and we need to be careful how we claim that for ourselves lest we listen to their stories first but i also want you to know i'm not worried about the church jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that's founded upon the rock of the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, when we put that confession at the center of who we are, and we recognize that it is infused in the presence of the Holy Spirit, then we have access to the same power that spoke the cosmos into being. We have access to the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We have access to the same power that infused the church on Pentecost. Oh, church, we need not be worried. For Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that is the confession upon which we are based. And when we share that confession, we receive the keys to the kingdom. Jesus said, I am giving you the keys to the kingdom so that what you bind will be bound and what you loose will be loosed. Now, so often when we read and discuss this passage, we get caught up in what that authority is. What can we bind and what can we loose? You know, we we get caught up in that. But I think to do that is to miss the point. Because the point here is that we've been given the keys to the kingdom of God of heaven think about it when somebody gives you a key what's the first thing you think what's the first question that you ask what's it to right you don't ask what it'll do you know what a key does key locks the key unlocks you don't ask what's it going to do you ask what's it to and that's the point here it's that the key is to the kingdom of heaven we have in our hands based on our confession of Jesus as Christ, the Son of the living God, we have in our hands the key to the kingdom of heaven. Do you get that? And what does that mean? It means that we can loose people and invite them into God's kingdom. It means that we have the opportunity to usher people into the kingdom of God through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It means we have entrance for ourselves based on our own confession, but then we've also begin, been given the responsibility to do the work of the kingdom in this world. Because to have keys is to have responsibility, isn't it? One of the first things they gave me when I showed up here was a set of keys. I still don't know what half of them are to. Have no idea. I know the one that gets me in my office. I'm doing pretty good with that. But to have a key is to have responsibility. For Jesus to say, I have given you the keys, means I have given you responsibility for the work of my kingdom in the world, for my mission in the world. We have the keys of the kingdom as God's church in the world today. What an awesome responsibility that is. What an incredible opportunity that is that God has given us. And all of that is based on the power of our shared confession. 
When we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we are bound together, we are empowered together, and we are charged together to do the work of the kingdom. Now maybe you're thinking this morning, you said last week we're going to be talking about new stuff. We're going to be talking about what God is doing that's new in the world. How's that new? That's 2,000 years old. This is old news. How is that in any way new? We are only here today because the church and each generation made a new confession. As the world changes, as the situation changes, as history moves on, we have to make for ourselves in this day, in this hour, in this iteration of Calvary Baptist Church, for this piece of the kingdom of God, a new confession in a new moment. It's the same truth, but we have to speak it again for ourselves in a new way. You see, we can't rely upon the confession of Peter. We can't rely upon the confessions of the mothers and fathers of the church. We can't rely upon the confessions of the martyrs. We can't rely upon the confessions of the reformers. We can't rely upon the confessions of the saints of this church who have gone on before us. All of them made their own confession in their own day, and so must we today as Calvary Baptist Church make a new confession. And the moment and the day in which we live, in the circumstances of our lives today, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that must be our only confession. As I watched events unfold this week, I thought a lot about what to say and what not to say. I thought a lot about what we as God's people ought to be about in this moment. And what I think the answer to that is, is that we ought to be about the singular confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We should have no other confession. We should have no other commitment. We should not give ourselves over to any other person or party or movement or anything else. You know, our history as a church is pretty direct that when we get too connected with temporal power, things usually don't go very well for us. No, our, our call in all the ages, but especially in our day today, is to hold to that singular confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, the full gospel of Jesus Christ into the world as loudly and clearly and directly as we can. To talk about love and grace and mercy and justice and peace and conviction and repentance and restoration and transformation, all of those things that are part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't cherry pick it. We need to put it all out there. And we do it under the sole confession that we are completely utterly dependent upon and committed to Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. A new confession for a new day. You can imagine that I've preached this text a few times. And until this week, I I usually kind of ended, came back to the same place, came back to that essential question, Who do you say that I am? And in each case, I made a decision to change what is in Jesus' question to the disciples as a plural pronoun to a singular one. To ask, who do you, each individual one of you, say that Jesus is? To make it a personal decision. And at some point, as Carrie Beth said with the children this morning, it has to be a personal decision. Each one of us have to come to that place of faith. And so I don't think it was a mistake to do that, but I think today requires a different question. In fact, I believe it requires the original question that Jesus asked because it was to a group. It was plural. 
who do you or in Georgia, y'all, say that Jesus is? Who do we as Calvary Baptist Church in this moment, in this community, in our day, say that Jesus is? We have to answer that question as a church for us in this day so that God can continue to be about the work of making us into what God needs us to be in this place and this hour. And so may it be our confession today that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and may the power of the Spirit of Christ be at work making us a new community. Let us pray together. Oh God, we pray that from this place always, as it has been for nearly 200 years, may the message from this place always be the basic confession that Jesus was the one sent to deliver us, the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the Christ, who was your son, sent to deliver us from ourselves and into your presence. May that always be the message proclaimed and lived from this place. Help us, O God, through the power of your Spirit, make in us the new creation of the church you would have us to be for this day, for this moment, to meet the challenges of our time. Not for our sake, but for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. How will we confess Christ together?